The Philosophic Corruption of Physics, Lecture 2. Yesterday I gave you a brief indication of Newton's extraordinary accomplishment in creating the modern science of physics. And we saw that Newton's legacy consists not only of his discoveries in physics, but also of some essential aspects of the proper philosophic foundation of physics. And I stressed the efficacy of reason, the law of causality, and Newton's inductive method as part of his philosophic legacy. Now, at the end of class yesterday, um, we saw that Kant rejected in total that philosophic foundation. And today I'll start by discussing Kant's physics, which is based on his primacy of consciousness, that is, his so-called Copernican revolution. Now, at the end yesterday, I mentioned that in 1786, uh, Kant presented his approach to physics in a book entitled Metaphysical Foundations of Natural Science. And I want to start by describing the structure of this book. Now remember that in the Critique of Pure Reason, Kant identifies 12 basic innate concepts that determine the form of all experience. He organized these concepts into groups of three. And each group of three concepts is allegedly related in a similar way. The second is in some sense the opposite of the first. And the third is a combination of the first two. So each group of categories follows the pattern of thesis, synthesis, I mean antithesis, and synthesis. Um, now this is the bizarre nonsense that led to Hegel's dialectic logic, if you've uh, heard of that. Now, I've written one of the uh, groups of Kant's categories on the board. Um, the first category is reality, second, negation, third, limitation. And you can see Kant's pattern here. Negation is the opposite of reality, and then limitation is reality combined with negation. Okay? Pretty clever, huh? Now, of course, this is just rationalism carried to the point of psychosis. So why do I even bring it up? Well, because Kant structured his whole book around these categories and attempted to derive physics from them. The book has four parts corresponding to the four groups of innate concepts. And within each part of the book, there's a principle of physics corresponding to each category. <clears throat> All right, now <clears throat> I turn to the content of Kant's physics. And I'll begin with the most interesting and influential part of the book, which is on dynamics, or forces. And the <clears throat> categories and corresponding principles of physics are as I've written on the board. They're the three categories I just described, reality, negation, and limitation. And, Kant says, the principles of physics corresponding to those categories are repulsive force, attractive force, and body. Now, why does Kant say this? Well, he says that repulsive forces are the cause of an object's extension and solidity, its capacity to reject other objects from its space, and therefore such forces are the principle of reality in physics. Okay, now you, you see his reasoning. If there were not repulsive forces, you know, matter would collapse. Um, therefore, the principle of reality, that which keeps bodies extended and solid so that they repel other bodies from the space they occupy, is repulsive force. Therefore, that's the principle of reality. Now, without doing a single experiment or citing any specific observations, Kant even deduces the mathematical form of the repulsive force. From the a priori conditions necessary for experience to be possible, that's one of Kant's favorite phrases. He claims that over short ranges, the repulsive force must vary as the inverse cube of the distance. Now, of course, this is just fantasy. There is no such force. Um, nevertheless, Kant proved there was. Now, on to the second category here, 
Kant argues that if there were only <coughs> attractive forces, material bodies would completely collapse. And so attractive force is the principle of negation in physics. Again, from the a priori conditions of possible experience, he proves in a single page that the attractive force must vary as the inverse square of the distance. And of course, this is just the law of gravitation, which Newton wasted an enormous amount of time and effort inducing from observations. So you can see the over-the-top rationalism of this, this whole approach, uh, um, the ultimate reject rejection of Newton's inductive method. Now the details of what Kant says about these forces are not very interesting, except to illustrate his anti-empirical armchair approach to physics. However, Kant presents three fundamental ideas in this section of the book that had a disastrous influence on subsequent physics, so I want to discuss those three ideas now. Number one, matter is reduced to force and motion. Or as Kant puts it, quote, the concept is reduced to nothing but moving forces, unquote. So appearances in space are simply centers of force and motion, according to Kant. Now you might ask, don't the concepts of force and motion presuppose material entities that exert forces and move? Not according to Kant. His dynamical natural philosophy, quote, explicates all the varieties of matter through the mere variety and the combination of the primary forces of repulsion and attraction, unquote. Now this is the primacy of action over entities. That is, action without the thing that acts. Now, why did Kant adopt this view? Well, recall that he rejects the whole physical world of entities. Physics doesn't deal with things in themselves, but only with mathematics applied to appearances. He thinks he can account for the motions of the appearances by reference only to forces. So why should he give them any other basic properties? Now, of course, real things have to have intrinsic properties. But according to Kant, Physics doesn't deal with real things. Now, it makes sense that Kant was the all-time champion of action detached from entities because he was the all-time champion of consciousness detached from existence. Remember that consciousness is an action. Recall Ayn Rand's first words in Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. Consciousness is an active process which consists of two essentials, differentiation and integration. So the primacy of consciousness over existence is the ultimate example of the primacy of actions over entities. And Kant was remarkably consistent in applying the primacy of consciousness to physics. Now you can think of this as a, um, in the way that uh, Harry Benzwanger has been discussing for the last few days, Kant's major trick was to replace the what with the how, right? To get rid of the object of cognition, replace it with the how or the form of consciousness. And that is, in effect, replacing the entity, the object of consciousness, with the action. The action of consciousness and grasping it takes primacy over the, the object or the entity. So Kant's primacy of consciousness is intimately related to his view of the primacy of action over entities in physics. <clears throat> now later we will see that this idea of Kant's corrupted the 19th century theory of force fields and it remains a fundamental error in contemporary physics. Okay, number two um, of the three main points I want to make in connection with Kant's uh, physics in this section of the book on dynamics. Number two is, forces act by no physical means. Kant endorses the idea of so-called action at a distance. Forces don't have to propagate through space. They act instantaneously on distant objects, according to Kant. Now this, of course, is a violation of causality. <clears throat> 
a physical effect must be caused by physical means. If something at location A affects something at location B, then it does so by means of something going from A to B. But this argument that I just gave you relies on the fact that causes are real physical entities. According to Kant, they aren't. On his view, causality is just an innate rule of the mind for ordering appearances. Therefore, he sees no reason to assume that some underlying causal mechanism is at work that is not given as an appearance. You see that? On the primacy of consciousness view of causality, there, there are just the appearances, and Kant views causality simply as an innate rule of the mind for ordering those appearances. The causes are not real things, so he sees no reason to assume some underlying causal mechanism that's not given as an appearance. Okay, so, action at a distance, which is equivalent to magic, doesn't violate Kant's primacy of consciousness view of causality. Now, I can't resist quoting Newton on this topic. Uh, because Newton didn't specify the physical means by which the force of gravity propagated, He's often accused of <clears throat> advocating action at a distance. Now, to dispel the myth, let me read a passage from a 1693 letter that Newton wrote to Richard Bentley. Quote, That the gravity of one body may act upon another at a distance through a vacuum, without the mediation of anything else, by and through which the action and force may be conveyed from one to the other is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has in philosophical matters a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it." Unquote. So, according to Newton, Kant must lack a competent faculty of thinking. And that's certainly true, to put it mildly. Now, the majority of physicists in the 19th century rejected action at a distance. But we'll see later in this course, uh, actually in the last class, um, that this idea has made a comeback in the quantum theory of the 20th century. And even more importantly, Kant's interpretation of the principle of causality from his primacy of consciousness perspective <clears throat> has been enormously influence, influential in physics. And we'll see that uh, throughout the rest of this course. Okay. Number three in this list I'm giving you. According to Kant, matter is continuous. There, he rejects the atomic theory of matter. No atoms. Now, Kant takes the view that matter is just space filled with force. Remember, he's reduced matter to force. That was point one. Now, Force is continuous and infinitely divisible mathematically, and therefore physically. If there are no things in themselves, and physics is just mathematics applied to appearances, then there's no place for conjectures about atoms. So on Kant's view, the atomic theory of matter has to be thrown out. Matter is continuous. Now, we'll see um, later, actually tomorrow, that Kant's view was enormously influential in the late 19th century, particularly on Ernst Mach and the positivists, and it led to disaster. Okay, now that's, uh, I think that's all I want to tell you for now about Kant's physics. Yes? Yeah, he, he, his argument was basically physicists describe force in terms of continuous mathematical functions. Uh, it's continuous mathematically, therefore physically. Um, it, everything I just told you is completely without foundation. Making a model and then trying to draw conclusions about reality from the model. Right. It's just the wrong direction. 
Yeah, that's essential to his Copernican revolution that he does everything in the wrong direction. Um, yes? Did he actually believe this? Did he, <laughs> I mean, did he have an evil purpose? Or did he actually believe what he was coming up with? Well, um, I think his physics is very consistent with his underlying philosophy. Um, if you're asking me whether I think that Kant was honest, the answer is no. Um, but I reached that conclusion not primarily on the basis of this uh, wrong physics, but on the basis of his outrageous views in philosophy, including the rejection of happiness um, and the complete detachment of virtue from value. Anyone that does that is being dishonest. Um, okay. Well, let me um, go on now <clears throat> and tell you how Kant's ideas affected physics in Germany in the early part of the 19th century. Now, they had an immediate effect on physics in Germany, and the result was an orgy of irrationalism. Behind all the verbiage, the essence of Kant's message was to hell with reality. The message came through loud and clear, and most intellectuals in Germany were eager to embrace it. They were sick of the age of reason and enlightenment, and looking, looking for an excuse to reject Newton and put forth their view of the world. And Kant gave them what they needed. Now, the period from the 1790s to about 1840 is known as the Romantic period in German natural science. Some of the main figures of this school are Hegel, Schilling, Goethe, Ritter, and Orsted. The movement dominated physics in Germany for about 40 years. <clears throat> and the following ideas are characteristic of romantic natural philosophy. And again, I'm going to give you three major ideas of the romantics. It, now, it looks like I've split every, my notes up into Kantian triads, but it's just the way it came out. Okay, number one. Kantian rationalism and mysticism. The Romantics made free use of intuition, deductions from innate ideas, and typically rejected the experimental method. They looked inward, not outward. Johann Ritter, one of the leading physicists of this school, writes, quote, We possess an inner sense, as yet undeveloped, for knowing the world. It does not see or hear, but it knows. Kant had said that the emotions, not reason, provide our only insight into the noumenal world, and the Romantics took him seriously. <clears throat> okay, point two. Nature is viewed as an organic whole. The Romantics hated the so-called mechanistic, lifeless world view of Newton. They viewed the whole universe as a superorganism, driven by a cosmic will. Now again, this comes from Kant's idea that the will is the key to the noumenal world. The Romantics disdained analysis, that is, the dissection of reality by reason, and therefore they worshipped the whole. Now as a result, the Romantics were not very interested in mathematics. Uh, for the most part, they rejected that aspect of Newton's legacy as well. Okay, number three. Nature is viewed as a conflict of opposite forces. Now this, of course, comes directly from Kant. It combines the thesis, antithesis, synthesis structure of his categories with the view that matter can be reduced to force. The result is that the whole physical universe is constructed out of a conflict of opposite forces or polarities, as the Romantics like to call them. Okay, that may not sound like a very good uh, basis for physics, and it isn't, um, as we'll see. Now, I want to give you a sample of the irrationalism that erupted in German physics after Kant. Now, given the above views, it's obvious that the Romantics must have hated Newton, and they did. Their attitude is best illustrated by the writings of a famous hater of Newton, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. 
and Goethe's years are 1749 to 1832. Now, Goethe is best known for his poetry, particularly for the verse drama Faust. However, according to his own self-evaluation, his greatest accomplishments were in physics. Now, before I describe these so-called accomplishments, let me give you a little background. Goethe rejected Newton's view of a completely causal universe that can be described mathematically. He claims that such a mechanistic approach, quote, destroys the inward life to offer from without an insufficient substitute for it. The mutable becomes rigid, description and expression uncouth, unquote. In other words, what infuriates him about Newton's view is that reality is real and immutable to whim. And needless to say, Goethe was a Kantian. Now, Goethe also despised Newton's experimental method, which he regarded as a violation of nature. Newton, he claims, disturbed nature by his experiments. In revenge, nature offered him only a distorted image of herself. Goethe writes, quote, Mysterious in the light of day, nature will not be denied her veil. And what she does not make manifest to your spirit cannot be forced from her with levers and screws. Unquote. Now this attitude toward experiment is part of the reason why Goethe was particularly offended by Newton's book on optics, which is one of the greatest works of experimental physics in history. Newton describes over a hundred experiments, ingeniously designed and meticulously carried out in a logical sequence that led to one discovery after another about the nature of light. It's an illustrated guide in how science should be done. In regard to scientific method, I think Newton's optics is as important as the Principia. Now the first part of the optics presents Newton's theory of colors. He proves that white light is composed of all the colors in the visible spectrum, and then gives a detailed account of the refractive and reflective properties of the colors. In the 18th century, Newton's theory of colors have been hailed as one of the great achievements in physics. But in post-Kantian Germany, Goethe describes it as, quote, an abandoned building fit to house only invalids, rats, and owls, unquote. Goethe sets himself the goal of, quote, demolishing it wall after wall, arch after arch, the rubbish being cleared away. So, in 1810, Goethe publishes his own theory of colors. Goethe's book is the diametric opposite of Newton's in every respect, in underlying philosophy, in method, and in content. Now, what is the Kantian approach to the science of optics? Well, let me describe it for you. Goethe opens the book by remarking, quote, it may naturally be asked whether, in proposing to treat colors, light itself should not first engage our attention. But it is useless to attempt to express the nature of a thing abstractly. Effects we can perceive, and they sufficiently define nature." Unquote. So at the outset, Goethe rejects the idea that optics is the study of something out there in reality, namely light. Instead, he regards the whole science as the study of certain aspects of perception, the effects of light on us. Okay, now given this primacy of consciousness approach, how should he begin his book? Well, exactly the way he does begin. He starts by discussing after images, optical illusions, the visual effects of pressing on one's eyes, and the effects of wearing and removing colored glasses. He doesn't study light. He studies his own visual system. And he doesn't even study his own visual system in its <clears throat> normal mode of perception. He's mainly interested in the visual system detached from the world. That is, when it is not perceiving or perceiving only in an abnormal or diminished way. He's interested in looking inward, not outward. <clears throat> 
Now, this is perfectly illustrated by Goethe's study of after images. He would sit <clears throat> in a darkened room and then briefly expose himself to a bright light. Then he would close his eyes and examine the after image in detail, describing the changes in intensity and color, timing its duration, etc. Now, he drew conclusions about the nature of color from these studies. Now, if you want to grasp the essence of Kantian physics, keep this picture in mind. Goethe studying the nature of colors by sitting in a dark room with his eyes closed. He was studying appearances, not reality, just like a good Kantian should. Now, what is color according to Goethe? Well, as you might expect, it is a synthesis of opposites. Color results from a combination of light and dark in the presence of a medium. He held that it was intuitively obvious that white light was elementary and pure, not a mixture of colors as Newton claimed. Now, Goethe does not entirely shun observations, as some of the Romantics did. He even cited observations of light passing through prisms in order to support his theory of colors. But, of course, he didn't believe in doing the sort of carefully controlled experiments that Newton did. That would be disturbing nature, trying to extort the truth from her with levers and screws. So instead, Goethe made sloppy, qualitative observations with his prism, which didn't produce a clear spectrum, but only an image of white light with colors at the edges. Since the colors appeared only at the edges, he took this as proof that color was a combination of the white light in the image and the darkness outside it. So, in essence, Goethe refused to do the experiments properly, and then he accused Newton of lying about the results. To arrive at Newton's conclusions, Goethe claims that, quote, nothing will do but lying, and plenty of it, unquote. You can see the hostility here. He's just seething with it. Now, a Kantian can never have enough triads, so Goethe identified three basic colors, red, blue, and yellow. The other colors are claimed to be combinations of these three. He concludes his theory with a discussion of the emotions evoked by the different colors and their combinations. The various shades of yellow produce predominantly positive emotions, whereas blue produces mainly negative emotions, etc. Now, that might seem a bizarre way to conclude a book on optics, um, but if we're not studying reality and only inner states, it makes perfect sense. Of course, there's no corresponding section of Newton's book for Goethe to compare to because Newton was studying reality. Okay, now I want to tell you about one more important figure from the Romantic period of German physics. His name is Johann Wilhelm Ritter. And he led a short but eventful life. Uh, his years are 1776 to 1810. Um, let me see, before I uh, tell you about Ritter, are there any questions about Goethe? Yes. Did Goethe um, come up with the primary colors and do it in a valid way? Or just... No. The, see, a lot of, some of what Goethe did would have been valid in a certain context. If he had said outright, I'm interested in studying the physiology of perception or I'm interested in studying the visual system, well, those are perfectly valid uh, scientific uh, investigations. But Goethe explicitly said that his book was, I mean, the purpose of his book was to replace Newton's book. Now, Newton's book is a book on optics, on the nature of light, um, and the nature of color. So the issue of uh, primary colors, the effect of mixing the colors, for instance, in the way we see it, doesn't really come up in a book strictly on, on optics, on the nature of light. So, in the context in which Goethe presented his work, none of it's valid. Um, if he had qualified it as, well, I'm not doing what Newton did, I'm, I'm simply um, studying the visual system, uh, then uh, 
then some of it, at least, would have uh, would have had some validity to it. But his uh, his whole approach was to, I mean, his goal was to reject Newton's physics for philosophic reasons. Yes. The the evil that Kant had, I mean, he certainly ignored reality and writing and making writings. That the, the only it seems to me the only way that evil could be propagated because everybody else says, oh, this is what I feel too, and therefore people like this ability and stuff like that are doing the same thing. So it's like the whole culture was wanting something to validate their their positive consciousness. Is that what's going on? Um, the question is, um, in order for this, uh, these evil ideas of Kant's to propagate, don't they require equally evil people um, to accept such ideas and, uh, um, and do the sorts of things that Goethe and the other Romantics did? Well, the answer to that question will uh, come out in the course of, of the rest of the lecture. but. I can give you a brief answer um, now. I think the way that evil ideas propagate in physics is, for the most part, in diluted form. When some aspect of the bad idea is accepted by someone who is essentially good, because the good physicists have much more impact in the long run on the history of physics, this romantic movement, as we shall see, will self-destruct because these people were too evil. Um, all right, now, uh, yes. Did these people study with Kant? I mean, were they students of Kant, or were they just reading his work? Yeah, they all read Kant, and they, um, they were also influenced by some philosophers that came immediately after Kant that I'm about to, to mention. Um, Did they physically meet him, discussion words with him, or...? No, Kant was a little bit out of the mainstream in that he was a bit of a hermit. He was off in um, Konigsberg, uh, um, sitting in his room by himself for the most part, just you know writing. Um, he he didn't have. Uh, I mean, Kant was not in a major intellectual center in Germany, uh, but they all knew of, of his work. I mean, he was a university professor, um, but I don't believe that. And most of these other intellectuals that I'm talking about did not have direct dealings with Kant. Brian? The theme of Faust carries on this, this same sort oh, of yeah, thing. Oh, yeah, see it. Are, are there any specific things in there that were, uh, you know, dealing with any specific scientists or particular ideas, or was it, was it just a... Not, not that I remember. I read Faust a long time ago, though, and I want to reread it. Um, in fact, I intended to do that before this conference, but I, um, I got hold of a bad translation that I simply had to give up on. Um, if you're going to read Goethe, the translation is really important because there's, there's very different translations out there, and some of them are really bad. Okay, let me go on um, to... Uh, to give you some information on Johann Ritter now. Now, in contrast to Goethe and most of the other Romantics, <clears throat> Ritter actually made important discoveries in physics. But we'll see that his philosophic convictions led him to absurd conclusions and eventually destroyed his career in science. In 1796, at the age of 19, Ritter entered the University of Jena near the city of Weimar. Now, Kant's ideas had already taken over at Jena. Ritter's teachers were two of the leading romanticists, Schilling and Schlegel. I know that sounds like a vaudeville act, but they, they actually weren't funny. Young Ritter was seduced by their ideas, which guided him throughout his career. Now, Ritter rejected only one fundamental aspect of the romantic natural philosophy. He believed in doing experiments. He writes, quote, If there is no point in piling up hypotheses, if true desire to know cannot be satisfied by a somehow, a perhaps, and it is possible, then we can only hold on to experience. It is only at her side that we will walk happily. However, if we leave her and trust ourselves to the wings of our imagination, <clears throat> 
we might have pleasant dreams, but wake up all that more unpleasantly. Unquote. Now, it was Ritter's acceptance of this part of Newton's legacy that led to his successes in physics. But we'll see, it wasn't enough to save him. Now, in his early 20s, Ritter did his first important experiments on electricity. And before I tell you about them, I need to fill in some background. Um, you probably remember how Ayn Rand's hero in Anthem discovered electrical current while doing experiments in the subway. He saw a frog legs twi frog's leg twitch when it was connected between two different metals, for example, copper and zinc. Now, this discovery was actually made by an Italian biologist named Luigi Galvani, who published his results in 1791. Galvani thought he had discovered a special force residing in the bodies of animals, which could perhaps explain the vital force of living creatures. Now, a physicist and colleague of Galvani's, Alexandra Volta, rejected the biological interpretation of this experiment. Volta thought that the current was produced primarily by the metals, so long as they were connected by some suitable fluid. He showed that he could produce a current simply by immersing copper and zinc rods in acid. Now, the controversy over the interpretation of these experiments was the hottest topic in science when Ritter began his career in 1797. Ritter made his own investigations and showed that a current could be produced even in slightly acidic or salty water, and that the process resulted in the chemical oxidation of the zinc electrode. Now, on the face of it, Ritter's work seems to support Volta's view and disprove Galvani's interpretation in terms of a special animal electricity. However, such a conclusion was too logical for someone in the grips of Romanticism. Despite the facts, Ritter entirely agreed with Galvani that life was essential to electrical current. But he also agreed with Volta that such electricity could be found throughout nature, even in inorganic materials. So he concludes that all of nature is suffused with the life principle. He thinks he has proven scientifically what his teachers have been telling him, that the universe is a living organism. He writes, quote, where is the sun, where is the atom that would not be a part of, that would not belong to this organic universe? Where then is the difference between the parts of an animal, of a plant, of a metal, or of a stone? Are they not all members of the cosmic animal, of nature?" Unquote. Now he goes on to argue that electricity is the organizing principle of all matter. It unifies nature and endows everything with life. Now, consistent with this principle, Ritter denied the existence of electric insulators, that is, materials that don't conduct electricity. Later, he claimed to have found annual variations in the strength of electric currents, proving that one year is, quote, the pulse rate of the cosmic animal, unquote. And he was the first to suggest that electricity might be used to reanimate dead bodies an idea he published in 1798, 20 years before Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. Now, it's worth mentioning one more example of how Ritter misinterpreted his results. In his experiments with electrodes in water, he noticed that oxygen bubbled up at the positive electrode and hydrogen at the negative electrode. He carefully measured the amounts of the gases and found about twice as much hydrogen as oxygen. Now, this was a great experiment. Ritter had discovered evidence that water was composed of hydrogen and oxygen, approximately in the ratio of 2 to 1. But there was a problem. Ritter thought it was intuitively obvious that water was a basic element, not a compound. Just as Goethe had thought it was intuitively obvious that white light was pure and elementary and not a mixture of colors. So Ritter, in effect, denied his own discovery and instead claimed that hydrogen was a compound of elementary water and negative electricity, 
whereas oxygen was a compound of elementary water and positive electricity. So we see that good experiments are not sufficient for good science. This is a crucial point. Even when a Kantian does experiments, the effort is largely wasted unless there is a Newtonian around to provide a rational interpretation of the results. Now, of course, a scientist faces the preliminary question of what experiment to do. Early in Ritter's career, when he did all of his good experiments, he was following up on work started by Italian and English scientists. Later, when he originated and pursued his own investigations, he discovered nothing. He spent his last years using divining rods and pendulums to search for polarities, that is, for the opposing forces that Kant had said make up the universe. He tried to explain the alleged power of divining rods to find water and iron. He used a pendulum to discover hidden polarities in metals, fruits, and people. Ritter had started out a talented experimental scientist. Under the influence of Kant and Schilling, he ended up a witch doctor doing occult studies in magic. Now that's enough to convey the general character of German physics in the Romantic period after Kant. Romanticism can be thought of as Kant's Frankenstein monster. And it nearly destroyed physics in Germany for about 40 years. But the movement couldn't last. While physicists in England and France were making great discoveries, the Germans were producing almost nothing but absurdities and dead ends. By the 1840s, nearly all German scientists turned against Romanticism, declaring it to be an embarrassing failure. Now this is a great example of the impotence of evil, exactly the question that was raised earlier. Irrationality cannot propagate in pure form. It has to be diluted. When German natural philosophers attempted to take the mystical side of Kant straight, science in Germany simply self-destructed. Well, so how does irrational, irrationality propagate in physics? Well, it propagates when good physicists who make important new discoveries accept some part of the irrationalism and incorporate it in their theory. And that's what happened when Kant's ideas first made their way to England. And that's the next part of the story we're going to cover here. Any questions on Ritter? It's a sad story, actually, um, because he, he was a talented young experimental scientist at the beginning. Um, but it's, you could hardly ask for a clearer case of what Kantian, what Kant's premises can do to an otherwise talented scientist. Okay, now, um, crossing the channel to England. The story starts here with an Englishman named Samuel Coleridge. Uh, his years are 1772 to 1834. Now, Coleridge was a medical school dropout who became a poet and third-rate philosopher. So you might well ask, <clears throat> how can a poet and third-rate philosopher affect the history of physics? That's what I need to explain. In the late 1790s, when Coleridge was in his 20s, he began to hear about the new ideas in Germany and became very interested in them. So interested, in fact, that in 1798, he left for Germany to translate Schiller's plays into English and to study the philosophy of Kant and its application to natural science. During his stay in Germany, Coleridge was completely converted to Kantianism and the new romantic natural philosophy. He swallowed whole all the irrational ideas that we've discussed and became an enthusiastic advocate of them. Now, among the ideas were nature consists not of material entities, but of forces or powers. Nature arises out of a synthesis of conflicting and opposite forces. Um, and nature is an interconnected organic whole. Now here's some typical quotes from Coleridge. Quote, The essence of matter is an act or power which it possesses in common with spirit. Here's another one. 
Every power in nature and in spirit must evolve in opposite as the sole means and condition of its manifestation. And all opposition is a tendency to reunion. The identity of thesis and antithesis is the substance of all being. Their opposition is the condition of all existence. Okay, straight out of Kant. And last but not least, quote, nature attains its highest significancy when she appears to us as an inner power, when she reveals herself as a plastic will, unquote. So you get the idea. Now, one more person advocating such nonsense in Germany could not have made the least bit of difference. Unfortunately, after absorbing these ideas, Coleridge returned to England in 1799. And shortly after returning to his hometown of Bristol, he met a young chemist named Humphrey Davy. Davy's years are 1778 to 1829. And he was to become one of the leading scientists in England. Now, at the time he met Coleridge, Davy was just starting his career. He was working at a medical institute where they were attempting to cure diseases by having patients inhale certain gases. And Davy had just made his first discovery. He learned how to produce pure nitrous oxide, commonly referred to as laughing gas. Now, this discovery made quite an impression on Coleridge. He and Davy became close friends. They spent a lot of time together discussing philosophy and science. And Coleridge was a very willing participant in Davy's extensive experiments on the effects of inhaling nitrous oxide. Both men became addicted to the gas for a while. In effect, they engaged in a trade. Davy supplied the laughing gas, and Coleridge supplied the Kantian philosophy. They discussed the critique of pure reason in between fits of hysterical laughter. You think I'm making this up, but I'm not. Davy describes one of these experiments as follows. Quote, By degrees, as the pleasurable sensations increased, I lost all connection with external things. Trains of vivid visual images passed through my mind and were connected with words in a manner as to produce perceptions perfectly novel. I existed in a world of newly connected and newly modified ideas. I theorized. I imagined I made discoveries. As I recovered my former state of mind, I felt an inclination to communicate the discoveries I had made during the experiment. With the most intense belief and prophetic manner, I exclaimed to a colleague, nothing exists but thoughts. The universe is composed of impressions and ideas, pleasures and pains, unquote. Now, I think you can see that laughing gas and Kant are a powerful combination. Now, Davy was converted, and the conversion brought about an immediate change in his scientific terminology. Whenever possible, he dropped references to physical substances and began speaking in terms of energies or powers. Now, he never became a consistent advocate of the romantic natural philosophy, but he did accept some of the main ideas, including the idea that matter is reducible to forces. Now, in 1801, Davy accepted a job as professor of chemistry at the Royal Institute in London. Over the next dozen years, he made a series of important discoveries and became the leading chemist in England. He discovered the elements potassium, sodium, calcium, and chlorine. He showed that diamond is a rare form of carbon. He showed that hydrogen is the cause of acidity, not oxygen as was previously thought. And most importantly, he developed the theory that chemical reactions are caused by electrical forces between atoms. Now, it may seem odd that Davy, in effect, denied the existence of physical entities and then went on to discover so many of them. To see how Kant's ideas affected Davy's science, we need to examine what Davy thought the chemical elements, or atoms, were. Now, in short, Davy thought that the fundamental constituents of matter were merely centers of force. 
He viewed them as mathematical points, nothing in themselves, just locations which emanate attractive and repulsive forces. The chemical elements were made up of complex combinations of such centers of force. Different combinations give rise to the variety of elements we see in nature. So, for instance, each atom on Davy's view has several of these little mathematical points in it that emanate attractive and repulsive forces. And the different atoms are different combinations of these point centers of force. Now, Davy did not originate this theory. He got it from Roger Boscovich, a Serbian physicist who published this atomic theory in 1758. Now, Boscovich died in 1787, uh, the year that Kant published the second edition of the Critique of Pure Reason. The theory was rejected by scientists during Boscovich's lifetime for the obvious reasons. People asked, where are the physical entities that exert these forces? One can't have forces without entities. And mathematical points are not entities. Points are merely a mathematical limit. They don't exist in reality, and they certainly don't exert forces. And that was the sort of uh, criticism that was made to Boscovich's atomic theory. Now, in the face of that criticism, Boscovich's theory was on its way to a well-deserved and obscure death until Kant came along and gave it life. Kant put forth a whole system of thought that did away with things in themselves. Matter, on his view, is just forces that move appearances through space. Remember, he reduced matter to force, the same that Boscovich is doing. Kant's philosophy undercut the objections to Boscovich's atomic theory and made it possible for scientists to accept the Boscovich theory. And Davy was the first influential scientist to do so. But Davy was primarily a chemist, not a physicist. By himself, he could not have caused a major change to the fundamental ideas in physics. However, in 1813, Davy hired a young laboratory assistant who could and did bring about such changes. His name was Michael Faraday. Now, Faraday was the greatest experimental physicist of the 19th century, in my judgment. And by his discoveries, he contributed more than anyone else to the development of the new theory of electromagnetism. He's one of the great geniuses in the history of science, and unfortunately, he plays a key role in the story I'm telling here. Now, Faraday was born in a poor section of London in 1791, the son of a blacksmith. He had no formal education. However, at the age of 13, he was apprenticed to a bookbinder, and he therefore had the opportunity to read many books. He made the most of it, reading the encyclopedias and the chemistry books in his spare time. Now, Faraday had an insatiable thirst for knowledge. At the age of 20, he attended a series of science lectures at the Royal Institute. Four of the lectures were given by Humphrey Davy. Faraday wrote down detailed notes adding his questions and thoughts on each topic. And it was at that point that he decided he wanted to be a scientist. So he sent his notebook to Davy along with a letter requesting a job. Now Davy was so impressed with the content of the notebook that in 1813 he hired Faraday as his laboratory assistant. And it was the start of an amazing career. Now, you can see the kind of person Faraday is here. And, um, He's, uh, he's a remarkable man um, with no formal education, rising out of the slums of London to become the greatest scientist in England. Um, and you can have nothing but respect for that. But we'll see here that um, Faraday does fall prey to some of these bad ideas that we've been talking about. Now, let me start by just describing two of Faraday's many crucial discoveries in electricity and magnetism. In 1821, 
he showed that an electric current produces a circular magnetic force around it. If you point your right thumb in the direction of an electric current, your fingers will curl in the direction of a magnetic force produced by that current. Okay, in other words, take, take your right thumb, point it in the direction of a wire carrying an electric current, your fingers wrap around in the direction of a magnetic force caused by that current. Now this is one of the four fundamental laws of electricity and magnetism. And Faraday gave extremely um, clever, eloquent, experimental proof of this fundamental law. Now the Faraday's work was actually an extension of work done earlier by uh, two other physicists, Orsted and Ampere. And this law is actually named after Ampere because Ampere was the first one to put it in mathematical form. Now the understanding of that law led to the discovery of another. If moving electric charges produce magnetic forces, Faraday reasoned, shouldn't it also work the other way around? Shouldn't a moving magnet produce electrical forces? And 10 years later, in 1831, he proved that it did. A moving magnet produced a circular electric force around it, driving a current in a loop of wire. Um, so if you have a, a circular loop of wire and you move a magnet through it, it will cause a current um, in that circular loop of wire. Now this is another one of the fundamental laws of electricity and magnetism, and it led to the invention of electric generators. And this law was named after Faraday. Now for our purposes, the crucial question is, what did Faraday think about the nature of the charged particles that caused these electric and magnetic forces? And here is where I think Faraday's lack of formal education may have hurt him. Humphrey Davy was the only teacher Faraday ever had, and that may in part explain the strong influence that Davy had on Faraday's ideas. But whatever the reasons, Faraday accepted the atomic theory he learned from Davy, in other words, the theory of Boscovich. He believed that matter was reducible to forces emanating from points. In an 1844 paper entitled a speculation regarding the electrical conduction and nature of matter, Faraday writes, quote, If we must assume at all, then the safest course is to assume as little as possible. And in that respect, the atoms of Boscovich appear to me to have a great advantage over the more usual notion. His atoms are mere centers of force or powers, not particles of matter in which the powers themselves reside. In Boscovich's theory, the particle of matter disappears, or is a mathematical point, while in the usual notion, it is a little unchangeable, impenetrable piece of matter with an atmosphere of force around it." Unquote. So Faraday is, in effect, using Occam's razor, the injunction not to multiply in a, in, entities beyond necessity in order to justify getting rid of entities altogether. Now, I mean, do you all, do you all see that? I mean, he's rejecting material entities, in effect, reducing them to points emanating forces. Okay, now, Faraday admits that the beginner in philosophy will find it difficult to conceive of a material universe from which manner, matter has been banished. But, he argues, quote, all our perception and knowledge of the atom is limited to ideas of its powers. What thought remains on which to hang the imagination of a thing independent of the acknowledged forces? The powers we know and recognize in every phenomenon. The abstract matter in none. Why then assume the existence of that of which we are ignorant, which we cannot conceive, and for which there is no philosophic necessity? Unquote. Now, Faraday is not merely rejecting the old, confused idea of substance. Most of you are probably familiar with Locke's idea of substance as 
the I, kn I know not what that attributes are attached to. Uh, this is the pincushion view of entities. Um, the entity is regarded as a, a substance without identity. And then the attributes are, are attached to it um, the way we would attach pins to a pincushion. Now, <clears throat> if, if that were the view that Faraday were arguing against, then we could only cheer him on. But that's not the case. Faraday is rejecting entities and replacing them with forces. But forces are only interactions between entities. So what is interacting here? According to the theory of Boscovich, nothing. Now I'll read one more passage from the 1844 paper on the nature of matter. Quote, The view now stated of the constitution of matter would seem to involve necessarily the conclusion that matter fills all space or at least all space to which gravitation extends. For gravitation is a property of matter dependent on a certain force, and it is the force which constitutes the matter. That's the key phrase there. It is the force that constitutes the matter. So you see from this passage that Faraday rejects the void, but he does so for the same reason that Boscovich and Kant did. Matter is equated with forces, Forces exist in a continuum throughout space, therefore matter fills all space. So Faraday doesn't reject the void for the reason that uh, um, I do, um, or um, Miss Rand did for that matter. It's, he rejects it because he's replaced, he's gotten rid of physical stuff and replaced it with force. And since force is everywhere, he claims that since force is matter, then matter is everywhere. Um, the proper rejection of the void would involve the realization that physical stuff is everywhere, not that force is everywhere. Okay, now, most 19th century physicists, except the Romantics, thought there must be a physical substance that pervaded space and served to propagate light and the forces of gravity, electricity, and magnetism. It had been proven that light had wave properties. Physicists reasoned that if light were a wave, something must be waving, and the something was the ether. Now furthermore, if magical action at a distance is rejected, then forces must be propagated by some physical means. And force, since forces propagate through space that is empty of particles, the physical means must be the ether. So most 19th century physicists thought there were two very good reasons for believing in some kind of physical ether that pervaded space. Um, one, light had been proven to have wave properties, so something must be waving and they assumed that was the ether. And number two, that forces must propagate somehow. And they assumed that the physical means of propagating forces, say the gravitational force of the sun on the earth, was through this physical ether that existed in, throughout space. But Faraday, like Boscovich and Kant, does not believe in a physical ether that fills space. Only force fills space. Mathematically, one can model these forces with lines, the length and direction of the lines giving the magnitude and direction of the force. Now, because Faraday had dispensed with entities in the ether, it was necessary for him to reify these lines of force in his theory. He viewed them as having an actual physical existence, or at least treated them that way. They provided his answer to the question, if light is a wave and there's no ether, then what is waving? Now here's a passage from Faraday's 1846 paper entitled, Thoughts on Ray Vibrations. Okay, ray vibrations are, are light. Quote, The view which I am so bold to put forth considers, therefore, radiation as a vibration in the lines of force. It endeavors to dismiss the ether, but not the vibrations. 
Okay, so light is vibrations in the lines of force. Now it turns out that this view does have a value as a way of picturing the mathematics that describe light waves. Uh, that's why all the elementary physics textbooks have diagrams that show light waves as vibrating lines of electric and magnetic forces. But as a physical theory of what light is, this is nonsense. Light is a physical thing, not an undulatory motion of an interaction. Interactions don't move. Entities do. And of course, Faraday's gotten rid of the entities in this case, so he's left with his lines of force. <clears throat> now, which of course he, we've just seen he reifies and treats as if it's a physical thing. Now, one more point on Faraday's physics, uh, and it's a point that Faraday doesn't emphasize, and yet I thought it was very interesting when I read it in one of his later papers, and it pertains to Faraday's views on space. Now, he wrote very little on this topic, but what he did say was surprisingly modern. At the end of his career, he spoke of forces as, quote, strains in space. Now, if space is the sort of thing that can be strained, then it's obviously being treated as a physical thing, not simply a relation among physical things. And later, we'll see that Faraday's view here anticipated Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, Einstein speaks of space in a somewhat similar way. Uh, we'll see uh, in uh, lecture four here that Einstein speaks of space contracting and curving. Um, Faraday here is speaking of space as um, strained. Uh, so you can trace this particular uh, false idea from Einstein back to Faraday. Okay, let me sum up. Faraday's discoveries were an enormous advance for physics, but his theory of the fundamental nature of matter was a disaster. The science of physics was losing sight of its object of study, the physical world. The world was dissolving into force fields and strains in space, just interactions and relationships with no entities to act or be related. And the person ultimately responsible for bringing physics to that state was the philosopher who did away with things in themselves, Immanuel Kant. Now, it's worth making one further comment here on the issue of how forces propagate. Newton faced the same problem with gravitation, but his answer was far superior to that of the 19th century physicist. Newton had the courage to say those three magic words, which are, I don't know. Good. Newton stated exactly what he did know, and then refused to engage in arbitrary speculation about that of which he was ignorant. Now that attitude is natural on the primacy of existence approach. But on the primacy of consciousness premise, what can there be that you don't know? Can there be appearances that don't appear? No. So in that sense, the primacy of consciousness leads in effect to claims of omniscience. Now, that's this is particularly true of quantum theory, but we can see it even in Faraday's field theory. Um, rather than simply saying, there's some physical stuff out here, the ether, but we don't know much about it, um, instead, we say, well, there is no ether, there are just these lines of force, and we know everything there is to know about them. Okay, well, that completes um, my... Uh, coverage of Kant's influence on early 19th century physics. And next time what we'll do is go back to Germany and look at the way Kant's ideas influenced uh, later 19th century physics in Germany. Um, so that uh, we'll draw a line here for today though and then I'll take a few questions. Brian. Oh. One of the earlier questions was uh, how was it that everyone was so ready to accept all these weird things when they came along? My thought on that topic had been that it was basically religion which was still around, uh, so that when 
these pseudoscientific ideas that came along. So the perfect example of that being the Big Bang. Yeah. A scientific idea came along and people would sort of latent religiosity and said, aha, I know what that is. You know, that's the finger of God creating the universe, or that's, you know, all these yeah. other things. Well, the, que the question is, how is it that um, that people were were so influenced by these ideas that strike us as so absurd? And I mean, I think my first answer would be that I mean, don't don't underestimate the fact that one of the reasons that these ideas strike you as so absurd is because you know objectivism. Um, if, if we didn't know objectivism, some of these ideas might strike us as strange, and the more obviously ridiculous of them we would reject. But I would be willing to bet that most of us in this room, and certainly myself included, would in some sense buy into um, some subtle forms of the primacy of consciousness um, and I mean, remember what the situation was with early modern philosophy. They, they didn't start by denying that there was a world out there that we could know. They started by saying, by citing things like the relativity of perception and saying, well, obviously, we're not aware of just the intrinsic properties of the entity as it is apart from our consciousness. Our consciousness obviously affects um, what we see. So they take the view that, well, what we really see then is, a, in effect, a state of our consciousness. And then we have to reason to the thing out there. So they're already trapped in consciousness. I mean, that was the basic mistake made by Descartes and all the early moderns after him. The best of the early moderns, Locke, made those those sorts of errors. And so philosophers are already trapped in consciousness, and whenever they try to get out now, they, they, because they've already made the fundamental error, all their arguments for reasoning from these alleged states of consciousness to reality are wrong arguments, and they get exploded by people like Hume. And then Kant comes along and exploits the confusion. So it Without a proper philosophy, I mean, validated axioms all the way down to the basics, you, it's easy to fall into errors and then one step at a time find yourself driven toward absurdity. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, I think that's about our time, so I'll see you back here tomorrow. Thank you. This course continues with Lecture 3.